Science fictions could soon become a hard reality in your living room with fibre optics bringing you hundreds of TV channels covering news, entertainment, plus home shopping, as well as allowing you to work from home and to scan the shelves of the supermarket or the library from your armchair. But would it be a dream come true, giving people more freedom and greater opportunity, or a nightmare where humans become complete couch potatoes? And should this telecommunications revolution be led and regulated by governments or left to market forces? And how long before Britain, which is leading the field, will have its own fibre-optic digital superhighway straddling cyberspace? Sam Roberts reports. Fibre optics are a British invention from the 1960s, allowing vast amounts of information to be sent as pulses of light along strands of glass. A single optical fibre, less than the width of a human hair, can carry over 75,000 telephone conversations simultaneously. My name is Sunil, and anyone can play a video game, but to be number one, you can't be lame. To step up, you peasants, and take your best shot, because I'm going to win, and you're not. From a living room in West London, James Vertigan and his nine-year-old neighbour are pioneers experiencing the new interactive world being created by fibre optics. You ready to rock? Let's play! OK, off they go. They're linked into one of the new cable television networks being laid in Britain. From its control centre, as well as over 40 conventional TV channels, there's so much space on the fibre optic cable that Videotron can send four versions of Games World, each carrying a different answer caption. Back on the couch, James gives his answer using a handset to a box under the set, which, depending on whether he's right, switches to the channel with the appropriate caption. It may not seem much, but it's early days for fibre optics. At the moment, the traffic along the cables is mostly one way. They're just being used to pump a lot more TV channels into the home. But if enough people get connected up, it could trigger a communications revolution that will alter the way we live and work. Your humble TV set will be transformed into an interactive multimedia terminal offering a myriad of information and entertainment services. If it happens, you'll be able to tune in to anything, anywhere, anytime. Have you ever watched the movie you wanted to? The minute you wanted to? Learn special things. It's all taken from jazz. Now any questions? From faraway places. Slim? So where did jazz come from? Good question. Or tucked your baby in. From a phone booth. As this ad from an American telephone company says, it's all technically possible. Someone just has to lay the fibre optic cables and make the dream of a digital superhighway come true. The digital superhighway is an emerging high capacity global communications network that will link every home and business. The phrase was first coined 15 years ago by Al Gore. We cannot tolerate, nor in the long run can this nation afford, a society in which some children become fully educated and others do not. The Director General of the British Cable Television Association visited New York last week to offer American investors the benefit of his experience. No other country has got as far with laying fibre optics to the home and creating the beginnings of a superhighway network. The UK today is the cable laboratory of the world. It's, it's leading the world in its, uh, its marketing of, of cable, in its technology it uses, in the, in the fibre networks that are being built. Um, Al Gore and, and, and Bill Clinton talk about a superhighway. We're actually building that superhighway today. And it's the marketplace in the UK that has, that has won the day. It's the marketplace in the UK which has has said... Britain's in a position to give advice to the rest of the world because we started so late. We only got going three years ago when deregulation allowed cable television companies to start offering telephone services as well, which is why we have fibre optics and everyone else is stuck with the old technology. Since deregulation, the number of cable TV companies operating in Britain has almost doubled. There are now 62. Between them, they've laid cables past more than three and a half million homes at a cost of over a billion pounds. By the year 2000, 
the industry is hoping to spend another £5 billion running fibre optic cables past 12 million homes. As a construction project, it will be second only to the Channel Tunnel. It's no super highway, but for anyone who has access to a reliable phone, there is already a global communications network up and running called the Internet. The Internet is an international network of switching centres connected mainly via existing phone lines that allows computer buffs to exchange information. It's an anarchic cooperative with no central authority effectively owned by its 15 million worldwide users. The Internet may be slow and not very user-friendly, but it offers access to an amazing amount of information from satellite weather maps to entire libraries of literature. It'll even allow you to make contact with the leaders of the free world. A consumer version of the internet could have wide-reaching consequences. The potential is to create a democracy where people can actually be informed, they can bypass the media's report of what's happening, they can read directly, uh, direct reports from people, they can read politicians' own statements, they can communicate with each other all over the country and start movements, and we already see this sort of thing happening on the internet. That's the potential. The other thing that gets people like Ben Rubenstein excited right. is the prospect of a superhighway plugging homes so into the sorts of virtual really worlds he can create. We have here all Take the paintings of Nicolas Poussin. Uh, Poussin actually painted two paintings a year or so apart, and at some point it was noticed that this group of figures is in exactly the same pose as this group, except reversed 180 degrees and we can actually lift out the group of figures, turn them around and drop them into the other painting to show that exactly how that works. But would commercial cable companies make space for such a service? We're not just interested in um, services or programmes that have a mass appeal. We like to cater for people with special tastes as well. So if you're interested in um, you know, electronic databases, for example, um, I would imagine that there are probably 5 or 10% of our viewers who would also be interested in, in, in that sort of information, in which case we would be providing it. The operating theatre might seem an unlikely candidate for connection to a superhighway, but that's what's happening at Hammersmith Hospital. Hello, David. I seem to have a problem here. A junior anaesthetist can call on an experienced consultant in another hospital who is sent via a fibre optic cable a view of the theatre and the output of all the monitors. This is just an experiment, but Hammersmith is on a government-funded network that's being built to link 50 universities and hospitals. And this is where Britain's largest telecommunications company, British Telecom, finally comes into the picture. They, and not the cable TV companies, won the contract to build this non-commercial network. But BT don't see why they shouldn't also make money by sending television pictures down their phone cables. But the government, in an effort to protect the cable TV industry, has ruled that out until 2001. BT argues it's not economic for them to lay fibre optics close to the home just for phones. The result is Britain's superhighway is being built largely without BT. There is a danger to the country as a whole. We're going to be left behind. If you look at the way this is going, most of all in the States, but also in Japan, and we expect the Europeans to be not far behind, then there is a prospect of the uh, Americans having a national broadband network to homes within the next few years. And at the moment, the only company that's capable of providing that in the UK with the resource and with the degree of access and with the investment already in place is BT. But Kenneth Baker, now a director of a cable TV company, believes the policy he helped frame in the early 80s is still the right one. The policy enunciated over 10 years ago was that there should be a competitive network to BT, hence Mercury's been established. Then after that, other companies would provide competitive local loops. And if you speak to uh, the industry apart from BT, that's what they want. That's how you want to get real competition. That's what the regulator wants, Mr. Crookshank. That's how you're going to get competition, and competition will drive this market on. Now here's the basic trend. In the end, no matter how interventionist or laissez-faire individual governments are, the technology now seems to have taken on its own momentum. It may not be long before some give up on reality. 
slip quietly into cyberspace. To understand cyberspace, it is helpful to conduct the following thought experiment. If you have a telephone conversation, where does it actually take place? At your end? Or in the intangible electronic milieu connecting you, known as cyberspace? <laughs> 